Well, good morning. I heard two people. <laughs> my name is uh, Jamie Mills. I'm one of the pastors here at Suburban. My wife and I have had uh, just the overwhelming, joyful privilege of serving beside this congregation for the past 17 years, two months, seven days. So uh, it has been an awesome opportunity uh, to partner uh, with you all and with an amazing staff that God has here. And I just could never say thank you enough for allowing us to be part of that. Uh, so Merry Christmas, Eve, Eve. I wasn't sure if you capitalized the second Eve or not, uh, but I did. So it's great to be with you guys today. I, I, I am grateful to have the opportunity to come to share with you, especially on a topic, to be honest, that's a real struggle for me. Uh, and so I, I love preaching on stuff that I struggle with because it causes me to dive deeper in it uh, myself. Uh, and I love to confront those things in my own life because it helps me to grow in my relationship with the Lord. And so I'm grateful to be able to talk to you guys. Uh, like Mike uh, mentioned, uh, I'm kind of the caboose for a series that we've been calling The Gifts of Christmas. I'm not sure who laughed at that. Um, the Gifts of Christmas. We've been talking about, um, about love and joy and peace. And today I'm going to be sharing about hope. And, and as I did that, I wanted to introduce you to a friend of mine. I don't know if you guys know who these people are. This is Jason and Olivia Klinkner, and I, like I mentioned, I've been here for 17 years. I was hired in October of 2001, and for the first probably, I don't even want to guess, long time, Jason and Olivia were some of my right-hand youth leaders. They loved it so much that they decided to move to Minnesota, and, um, but I'm going to tell you to do yourself a favor, like you can do it even right now. Uh, get, get out your phone and befriend Olivia Klinkner on Facebook. She's hilarious. Like, she's one of the funniest people that I've ever met in my life, um, It'll be, I mean, you'll thank me later. Just trust me. I told her to be prepared because it could be coming. Uh, but as I was uh, prepared, to, uh, preparing to preach on hope, I came across something that she put on her Facebook page. There is this picture, uh, and this is what it said underneath it. I spent some time in the candle aisle, and I found myself nostalgic for the good old days when candles were called things like vanilla. But now it's like walking onto the, stinking hall, uh, the set of a stinking Hallmark movie where everything smells like flannel scars and unrealistic expectations. And even though I know it was going to end with a, uh, being stuck in a feigned smile and an eye roll so deep I could see my frontal lobe, I stayed because who can leave without experiencing what burlap mustache and golden dew on bees' wings really smells like? <laughs> Still, somewhere between last call and meant to be, the cynicism kicked in. Because what kind of a person names a candle mom? And better yet, who lights that thing? <laughs> and for the love, can we please stop burning hope? So yeah, I made it out alive, but I left iridescent moonstone behind because in the end, it smelled an awful lot like vanilla. <laughs> she's super funny. And she, I mean, she's a gifted teacher. Um, she inspired me, actually. To go out and it's like, okay, our candles these days, are they really that messed up? Turns out she's onto something. Here are some of what I found. Have you ever wondered what awkward moments smell like? That's weird. What's next? Mantown. Who would light that candle? Besides my son. Anyone? <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Vanilla ice. Ew. Here's another one. Frat house. Never wondered what a frat house smelled like. Now this one I had to... <laughs> it's a real candle. Who buys a candle called Courtesy Flush? I don't think I could actually put that on the register with a straight face. My wife had to remind me of the next one that it's probably not speaking of the town. But when I first saw that, I thought, is a candle that smells like Sweet Home? If your friend's sweet home, it's a wonderful place. I'm not saying that it smells bad. I just thought it was weird candle scent. <laughs> the people in the aisle, as I was taking uh, pictures of candles, thought I was a weirdo, but it was worth every single moment of that. You know, but as I was looking at Olivia's post, something kind of caught my attention. It's why I decided to share it this morning. One is it was funny, but the other side of that is uh, this picture of, of, of burning hope, of evaporating hope. Where is hope gone? I mean, if we were to sit down this morning and we were to make a list of what this world needs, wouldn't those four things find their way to the top? Wouldn't we say that the world needs more love and more peace and more joy and more hope? 
We need these things in our country, in our state, in our community. We need them in our workplaces, in our homes, in our church, and probably most of all in our own lives. And I believe if that's ever going to happen, if we're ever going to see growth of those four things in the world that we live in, in the community that we live in, if we're ever going to see growth of those four things in our home, it starts with us. I hope that you've gotten some practical teaching out of the last uh, three, now four weeks as we've been going through this series, because if you decide that you want to apply those things to your life, I promise you they will change your life. Mike mentioned this, and, and I saw it too, and I wanted to repeat it, but there's two things that stuck out to me, uh, stuck out to me uh, in this series. One of, is, is that all four of these things involve some element of a choice that we get to make. Choice is involved. The other one is that they seem to rotate around the presence of Jesus in our life. And for whatever reason, things like love and, and peace and joy and hope don't always seem to be what we experience. And sometimes it feels more like we experience unforgiveness and chaos and brokenness and anxiety. And the truth is we live in a broken world. And if we want to see those things growing in our life, it's going to take some intentionality on our part. Some willful choices on our part. You know, brokenness is a part of the world that we live in. It's a part of the human experience. And I think you can look all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were there. And there was love and there was joy and there was peace and there really didn't seem like there was need for hope. And with one choice, with the choice to go against what God had told them, a new reality entered the world. There was shame and anxiety chaos and the need for forgiveness. And ever since that day, the battle between brokenness and love and peace and joy and hope has been raging in the hearts and the minds of mankind. And so what do we do? What do we do? If you have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you, you can open up to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, it's right after Matthew chapter 13. Uh, and we're going to look at verses 22 through 33. Uh, but before we dive into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what precedes the verses that we're going to look at. The very first part of, of, of Matthew chapter 14, you read about the death of John the Baptist. He died at the pleasure of a queen. He was executed. And John was close to Jesus. He played an important role in helping the world understand exactly who Jesus is. And it says that when Jesus found out about John dying that he got in a boat, and that he went away alone to spend some time praying. And it talks about how a large group of people found out where Jesus was, and so they went to where he was. And as Jesus saw them coming, it says that he had compassion on them. Jesus is compassionate. Even in the midst of his own heartache, Jesus is compassionate. And part of hope is right there. I hope you know that. Part of hope is believing that right there. That Jesus is compassionate. That he loves you. Has compassion for you. And I hope you believe that. And it says that the crowd was still with Jesus when evening came. And the disciples wanted Jesus to send the crowd away. But Jesus did something that's really hard for us to understand. It says that he took five loaves and two fish. And that he fed 5,000 men and their families that day. And that's where the passage that I want to read with you this morning picks up. In verse 22, Matthew chapter 14, this is what it says. Immediately after this, immediately after Jesus fed the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross the river to the other side of the lake and while he sent the people home. And after sending them home, he went up into the hills to pray. And night fell while he was there alone. Two times now. Two times we have seen Jesus break away, find time alone to pray. In moments when anxiety was lurking in his own life, Jesus prayed. He made room. He stopped to pray, sending his friends away, sending the crowd home, removing himself. He created space to pray, to seek God. And there's an element of self-care there that's really important for us to take note of. There's been a phrase that God has put on my heart a lot when it comes to these kinds of things, which is right here. No one can choose to do that for you. 
That is a thing that only you can choose to do for yourself. When anxiety is full-fledged in your life, when things are getting hard, only you can make the, the decision in your life to step back and to pray to God and to seek him in the midst of the storm. Verse 24 says that meanwhile the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves and about three o'clock in the morning Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him coming walking on the water they were terrified and in fear they cried out it's a ghost. But then Jesus spoke to them at, then Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid he said. Take courage. I am here. They were in trouble. They were out on the sea and they were in trouble. They were a long way from land and they were anxious and they were afraid. They were in full-blown panic mode. And some of these guys at least were fishermen, so they knew what they were freaking out about. They knew the danger of the sea. I have found in my one time at sea that if you see a fisherman start to sweat, that's probably not a good thing for multiple reasons. And Jesus says, take courage. Why? Why? Take courage, why? I mean, on one hand, they were freaking out. But he said, take courage because I am here. The presence of Jesus was and is intended to bring hope, to bring courage. And as you read on, we'll see that the presence of Jesus made all the difference. It changed things, both inside and outside of the disciples. And they learned an incredibly valuable lesson that day. That in the midst of the storm... He brings hope. Picking up in verse 28, it says, Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out to you walking on the water. And you can almost hear the other disciples look at him, What are you talking about? And Jesus said, Come. And so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But then he saw the strong wind and waves, and he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why do you doubt me? And when he climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. You know, for some people, this passage is is, is really hard to take in, and I think that's really, really understandable. I'm a fairly buoyant guy. Um, but, but (laughs) But I've never walked on water. It wasn't for a lack of trying, right? I've, I've never walked on water, never seen it done. And this passage can be really kind of a hard thing for people to wrap their mind around. But here's where I stand on that. If God is God, if he's really the creator and the sustainer of all that is and ever was, then we probably ought to expect things like this to actually happen. Because after all, isn't that kind of a thing what it ought to take to be called God? We should be expecting things like that if God is God. You know, sometimes the size of the waves in life, sometimes the force of the wind seem like too much. The pressure of life, of people, of our own mistakes, and sometimes even things that we don't understand cause us to be anxious. We feel like we're sinking. It makes it hard to breathe. Even think straight. And I want you to know that anxiety is a real thing. You're not a bad person. You're not a weak person. If you struggle with anxiety... Anxiety is part of the brokenness that that, that came into the world with sin. And to some degree, I think it's something that we all wrestle with. And there was a study that was done in 2017. They they took two years to look at some things, to try to measure the growth rate of anxiety in our culture. They did that by taking a look at those behaviors that often accompany anxiety. And I don't have the time to really kind of get into what they found, but here, I'll just kind of sum it up for you. It's not good. (laughs) What they found was not good, that the growth rate of anxiety... Uh, in, our, in our culture, in our families, in our lives, is something that should be uh, concerning to us. And my first thought was, oh great, one more thing to be anxious about. <laughs> right? But, but, but anxiety is growing, uh, is what they found. This same group of people came up with what they called the top ten reasons for anxiety in the culture that we live in. And here's what they say are the top ten reasons for anxiety, the top ten causes for anxiety. First one is feeling alone or abandoned, being isolated. The second one is that life seems out of control and that it's not ever going to change. Not seeing or sensing purpose for our life. Grieving loss, someone or a heart event or something. That we don't feel like we have what we need, either as a person or the resources. 
that you've messed up and feel guilty, that you've been deeply wounded from abuse, neglect, or just heartbroken, that you often feel pulled in the wrong direction, so constant temptation, that you live a life that's hounded by fear, or that you feel defeated, that you've already lost. I'm good at anxiety. You can ask my kids, you can ask my wife. Um, I'll be honest, when I first found that this was what I was going to be preaching on the, the song that, you know, whatever you can do, I can do better, kind of came into my mind. Um, anxiety is something that I grew up with. It's something that I battled pretty much all of my life. For me, it's, it's things like work. It's like raising kids. It's marriage. It's finances. It's never having enough time. It's my own expectations is a big one for me. And working with Pastor Rick. <laughs> Guy's a mess. <laughs> I'm only saying that because he's not here right now. But anxiety is real. And understanding hope can make a, a huge difference in our lives. Hope is a part of the full and the free life that God desires for you and I. Hope is a part of the full and free life that God desires for you. And I hope that you believe that. As I was digging around, I looked up the definition for hopeless. Get ready for this, super deep. Are you ready? It means to be without hope. <laughs> My first thought was, way to go, genius, right? Like, but the more that I thought about that, the more profound it seemed. Hopelessness is the absence of hope in our life. And as I looked at those ten things that they, they called the top reasons, or the top causes for anxiety in life, one of the things that I came to the conclusion was that hope in every single one of those situations can be a game changer, maybe even a lifesaver. Hope is often misunderstood. We often use it in ways that add to the confusion. Hope is not wishful thinking, right? Hope is not wishing or hoping that my wife will find the perfect Christmas present that costs exactly the same amount as how much she loves me. Last year I got an oven mitt, super confusing. <laughs> Hope is not optimism. Hope is not choosing to see how things might get better. In fact, I would tell you sometimes hope is embracing the fact that it is stinky right now. That it is hard, but. Another thing that I found that was really encouraging to me is that hope and faith are connected. Hope is an essential aspect of what it means to have faith. Faith is often described as belief and confidence in God. Hope, then, is faith looking forward. Hope is faith looking forward. It's belief and it's confidence in God applied to our current situation and to our future. Hope is faith looking forward. Hope has to do with being patient and waiting, right? Which we don't do well. Um, I could tell you an infuriating story. Sorry, this is getting off my ear and it's going to fall off in a minute. There you go. I can tell you an infuriating story as a kid from Oregon State, um, the first time that I went to Washington to get gas, Right? I waited there half the day. <laughs> and it was like I was getting angry, and I wasn't the only one because I started to look around, and all the other people started to get out of their cars and do it themselves. And so finally, I did it too, and I left a really strongly worded note, but it didn't do any good because every time I go there, it's the same thing. <laughs> Somebody in the first service came to me. He's like, you realize that? Yes, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> so hope has to do with waiting and patience, with expectation and anticipation, the strong belief and confidence that God is in control and applying that to our future. Patiently waiting, knowing with certainty that God is at work and that it will get better in his time. And with that, we see that hope is not dependent on my circumstances, but it informs them. Hope is not dependent on my circumstance. It informs them. It informs my circumstances. Hope is not situational. It doesn't rise or fall with the day. But it's the choice to trust in something or someone in the midst of all. And for us Christians, that, that's Jesus. And I believe that there's a lot that we can pull from the passage in, in Matthew chapter 14. One of them is that the presence of Jesus makes all the difference. And I can't get past Peter's response. It's always been a mystery to me. Peter takes a lot of heat for this whole situation. But Peter had faith. I mean, he got out of the boat. And it says that Peter walked on water until what? Until he, he got hyper-focused on his own situation. 
until he noticed the strength of the storm, the size of the waves, and the weight of the wind. And it's almost like he completely forgot that Jesus was literally standing right there. And as silly as that sounds, don't we do the same thing? He began to sink in the face of it, and we can relate to that. Sometimes the wind and the waves feel bigger than we are. Sometimes the wind and the waves are bigger than we are. And it's easy to feel helpless in the face of our circumstance. But Peter did something that I often think we neglect to do. In the midst of anxiety, in the midst of of chaos and fear, right in front of his friends, Peter cried out to God. He cried out to Jesus. He invited Jesus into a situation. And one of the things, this is probably my favorite part of all the stuff that I got out of this, right? One of the things that really stuck out to me in this whole situation is once, once Peter cried out to Jesus, it wasn't like he somehow was transported out of the situation, right? God, like, didn't teleport him to land. He was still in the midst of, of this storm that just a minute ago rocked his soul with fear and caused serious anxiety, but all of a sudden things were okay. Why is that? It was the awareness of the presence of Jesus. The awareness of the presence of Jesus. You want to know why I say the awareness of the presence of Jesus? Because Jesus was always there. He was always there. It was Peter's ability to recognize it. And sometimes when we get hyper-focused on things in our life, when we get hyper-focused on difficult things in our life, it's easy to lose sight of Jesus, even to forget that he's there But knowing that he's there, inviting him into our lives matters. And I think that he would speak the same truth to you this morning that he spoke to the disciples. There is hope. Have courage. I am here. The presence of Jesus brings hope and courage. I think hope really is the choice to see Jesus in the midst of our circumstances. It's like saying, I know that you're there, and I know that you care. I think another thing that we learn is that Peter knew that hope in Jesus was not misplaced. How did Peter know that his hope in Jesus was not misplaced? It was informed. Peter knew Jesus. One of the authors that I was reading as I was studying for this put it this way. Hope is based on God's word and not our wishes. God's word is a powerful tool in hope. And inside of it, uh, when we look into God's word, we we get a view of, of his character, of who God is and how God, or what God is like. We get to see how God interacts with people in the past. We get to understand what his desires for us are, what his promises over us are. And there's hope when we realize the overwhelming track record of just how faithful he is. Hope almost always has a sense of joy, knowing that God is in control and that things will get better despite how hard it is in the moment. It's not wishful thinking in or even about God, but it understands that there's reasons for hope. There's reasons to be confident in God, knowing him, knowing who he is, knowing that he's faithful, and knowing that he's with you, knowing that it will get better. As I was thinking about um, this idea of the sea and, and, and Peter walking on water, like my brain started to think all nautical, which is kind of scary, because like I said, my experience at sea one day threw up everywhere. But hope is like an anchor. Hope is like an anchor. In fact, Hebrews 6.19 says that uh, that hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. The anchor of a ship, uh, the anchor keeps the ship from drifting when waves are high and when wind is strong. I talked to one of my friends uh, that does this for a living just a minute ago, and he said that absolutely it's true, that when you're at sea, it's very important to know where you're dropping your anchor. You've got to find the right thing to anchor to. It has to be firm. It has to hold. And there are so many things in life that we try to put hope in that we'll never hold. Money, job, education, even other people. We need a strong anchor. One that will hold. Hope is also like a compass that even when visibility is bad, hope gives us direction. Even when times are rough, it helps us to see what lies ahead. Uh, we want to show you another video from uh, the Bible Project. It, it, you can go online, you can Google that, and you'll find all kinds of really helpful resources for you there. It really is worth your time to go check that out, especially if you have kids. I think they make it, like, it's really cool to do as a family, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, 
And then right after that, one of our pastors, Carrie Pinner, is going to come out and share a little bit of her unique experience when it comes to kind of working with these kinds of things. So watch this video, and then Carrie will come. So let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation, and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible, and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the floodwaters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavas for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kava and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, At this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kava for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms, where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kava for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord, because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see, in any situation, how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires, and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus, and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kava for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope, and they used the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The Apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus, who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is. But biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. So I find the Bible project to be really helpful, and I love this definition that they give of biblical hope, that is that sense of expectation, which is based on a person and not our circumstance. So I want to talk a little bit about how do we wait in hope, especially when we feel anxious. We can't just turn a light switch off and on. We can't turn our anxiety off and on. So where does choice fit into all of this? So we're going to look at the context of that in a relationship, 
way. And so we um, asked for some quotes from younger members of our community just to see what they had to say. And the question they were asked was, when you feel anxious, what do you do? So a three-year-old says, I try to get my mom or I just wait with a five-year-old. I like that one. I, like, I, like, I talk to my parents, an 11-year-old, and I like to be with others. That was from a 17-year-old. So you can see the tie into the importance of being in community with others. So what do choices look like relationally? The first choice is just to wait in community. Oftentimes, anxiety increases when we isolate ourselves or when we pull back. Um, and so find a healthy community and be intentional about growing in it. And let's be real, this is a messy process because we're messy people. And so we need to, you know, in that process, it looks like owning our own stuff. We've talked about some of this in the weeks previous to this, but asking for forgiveness, forgiving people, you know, moving out in love toward people. It's just a messy, messy process. Speaking truth to one another is also very important. Um, I, I have the privilege of being in several text loops that are based on prayer requests, and it's so encouraging to get a text from someone saying, hey, would you pray for me because this is happening, or for me to send out a text to people, and just to know that you're not alone in whatever you're in. I think another way is I um, love to be able to ask people to hold me accountable, and I don't mean the casual question of, how are you today? I mean, ask me the hard questions so that I know, you know, that just deal not only with my behavior, but my attitudes and my words, that I have found that to be very helpful. Another thing is just making sure that you're listening to the right voices in your life. We can so easily be led astray by advice or opinions, Facebook, whatever it might be. So take time to make sure that you are receiving, what, what you're receiving from other people is based on holistic truth. For example, we are told in John 10, 10, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So I love a real practical tool that Jesus gives us in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And so this is the story where Jesus is in the wilderness and he's tempted. I've heard a lot of sermons that talk about how did he deal with the temptation, and that was with the written word. Um, but I don't think I've ever heard a sermon that says, how did he use the written word? He used it out loud. He rebuked the enemy out loud. And I think it, it's sometimes hearing yourself say it out loud to either to the Lord or to another person, somehow it diffuses it in our brain a little bit and exposes our concern to truth and to light. I went to a workshop a couple of years ago on anxiety, and they talked about this very thing, that there is actually a brain shift when you can say either an emotion out loud or how you're feeling anxious. So I'm like, okay, that works. And we're learning this practice from Jesus himself. It's not like somebody just thought this up, you know. Another choice is choose to be in relationship with Jesus. If the biblical definition of hope is based on who he is, then I can't think of a better way to stay focused on hope than to be focused on him. And so I didn't you know, grow up going to church, and so I had to really wrestle with that question is, what does this mean? What does it mean to be in relationship with Jesus? What does that look like other than going to church? And I was asking those questions like, who is this guy? Can I trust him? Is he safe? And so I had lots of good opportunities over the years to be either in a Bible study or I spent time with an older woman who I would ask crazy questions because I didn't know Sunday school answers. I would say, who's this Moses guy? And what was he doing in the, I don't know, you know what's that about? And so it's just so helpful to have people be patient um, in my life with my, all my questions. But one of the biggest impactful things that happened for me was when I sat down with the Bible and I just started, I started looking up the word and the phrase, what does it mean to know him, to know God? And that practice for me, because it took me over a year and I wrote down all of them, because <laughs> I thought, okay, this is where I start. I began to learn more about his character, about his faithfulness, and that slowly began to change how I viewed the world and how I viewed him as well. Another choice is choose to seek help I think sometimes we all hit rough stretches on this road of life. And so think back on what Peter did from Matthew 14. He cried out for help. Yay, Peter. I think that's such a good model. Because sometimes what I like to call church face is the thing that we need to break. And that is people come to church on Sunday morning like, yeah, everything's good. You know, but we know life is real. 
And so being able to be honest about that is so important and to be able to say that to other people. So sometimes um, help can look like spending extended time in prayer. Um, so for about three years in my mid-20s, I really hit a rough patch and I just, I hit Psalm 62, eight, which talked about pour out your heart before the Lord. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna take that literally. So I just started pouring out my heart, all my questions, all the stuff that I was going through. Turns out when I look back at that time in my life, it was transformational for me. And it's, I still refer back to it now 30 years later. Um, sometimes it's asking a friend or a pastor to kind of walk through a time with you. Other times it might mean that you go to a doctor or to a counselor and just talking through different things to find out if there's a way that they can help you. It's not wrong to ask for help. And as we talk about choices that we um, can make to cultivate hope, I in no way want to minimize the real deal of mental illness. If this is part of your story, I recognize that some of these elements may apply and some may not. And I would never want to say that you don't have enough faith to overcome what's going on in your life. That's why I think it's so important to seek professional help and to not withdraw from community. Okay, we've talked about relational choices. Let's talk a little bit about what are the choices that we can do personally. And these are just a few. There are so many more that we can do. But so what are, what are our own private practices that we can do to help with anxiety? Choose to practice gratitude. Paul states it well in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There's something about choosing to be thankful or to look for the good that can help when often we just want to look at everything bad. Um, choose to pray and listen. So that verse in 1 Thessalonians brings up prayer with thanksgiving, as does Philippians 4, 6, which we looked at last week. I want to encourage you not only to pray, but to listen. Take the time to pause. I think about the centerpiece of Israel's prayer life, which was the Shema. And it was an entreaty to hear and listen and obey. And so often we approach prayer as talking. What can I speak? Here's my list, God. This is what I want done. And really, he wants us to be in relationship with him. He wants us to listen as well. And so what would happen if we did the opposite and listened first before we spoke? So when you're sitting in a hard place, ask the Lord, what do you want me to know about this? This is a question I ask almost every day. Or a question like, what do you want me to know about you in this? Or what do you want me to know about me? Or if I'm stuck and I don't feel like I'm hearing anything, I'll go, Lord, is there anything in my life that's hindering me from really hearing from you? And he's faithful. So I found that to be true. Another um, choice is choosing good waiting practices. Make sure you are actively seeking a balanced lifestyle. Do you have time for rest in your week? Or are you going all the time? You know, everyone, we're all so busy. Um, I recommend looking at the practice of Sabbath, where you set aside a weekly time to rest, to renew. Um, it can, you know, think reading or hiking, or it can be um, spending time with friends or prayer. Bruce and I have very different Sabbath practices. And so I like, often I like to have my hands in the dirt because I, I just love being outside and doing yard work. That's not his choice. Anyway, another one is, how does your work schedule balance with the rest of your life? Is that something where you need to edit? Being able to talk about that and think it through. And then do you have healthy moments for silence and solitude? Sometimes people are afraid of silence, and if that's your part of your story, then that's something to look at. Maybe even asking that question, okay, Lord, what do you want me to know about this fear that I might have? You know. I'd kind of like to take a minute to just summarize this sermon series that we've been focusing on during the Advent season. The first week we talked about receiving the love of Jesus and then out of that love, out of that overflow, we give love to other people. The second week we looked at about how pursuing peace is often that process of looking at unforgiveness, giving forgiveness, or asking for forgiveness. Um, last week we looked at joy. We recognize how important it is to trust Jesus in the hard stuff through prayer, shifting our perspective, recognizing his presence in our life. And then today, as we look at keeping our hope on Jesus, even in the midst of anxiety. And as we've looked at each of these Advent themes, there's a sense of choice in each one. Jamie brought that up. And then, but there's also this sense of invitation in each one as well. Jesus is constantly inviting us to be in relationship with him. So one thing that brings me hope when I hit bumps in the road is to anticipate what the invitation is. 
How might he want me to connect with him? So often we pull back or run away or we get stuck. Part of the meaning of hope is to anticipate. So I encourage you as you think through this Advent season and you know, here we are at Christmas already, just anticipate what is his involvement? What does he want from us? Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I'm going to invite the choir to come back. Uh, they're going to close us down today. And as they come out, a couple of things that I want to uh, remind you guys of as well. One of them is I just want to remind you guys that tomorrow is actually Christmas Eve. And at 4 o'clock, 530, uh, we're going to have Christmas Eve service. I want to encourage you guys to invite your friends and family to come and to participate. Uh, Mike is going to be sharing and Rick's going to be doing a story for kids. That's always my favorite part. Anyway, I just want to encourage you guys to make that invitation because sometimes an invitation makes all the difference. I also want to remind you of this. That God may not remove you from those things in life that make you anxious. But there is great hope in the choice of being aware of God's presence and in knowing that our hope that's placed in him will not disappoint us. Over 700 years ago, before Jesus was ever born, there's a phrase that we often, or a passage that we often use for this time of year. 700 years before Jesus was born, it's Isaiah 7, 14, and it says this. That the, the virgin will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I hope you hear the weight of what Isaiah is saying. God with us. There's hope. There is hope. In the midst of my marriage, there is hope. Jesus is present and there is hope in raising my kids and my financial situations. When I feel alone, when I am a mess, when my life hurts, there is hope. Emmanuel. God with us. I think that is the most hope-filled thing you'll ever hear. Let's pray. God, I am grateful for the hope that we have in you. God, help us to live that today and in the future. Amen. I thought we could end our service. We invite you to stand this morning as we sing Joy to the World one more time.
God bless you. Have a great Christmas. We hope to see you tomorrow again for our Christmas Eve services. God bless you.